In life, you'll be faced with many choices. For instance, should I wash my hands after using the bathroom? Or should I just skip it because nobody will know? Do I keep my promise to not share my friend's secret, even though it would make me really popular and it would be really funny to tell? Some choices can affect the rest of your life and the people around you. It's a very serious thing. But with the right guidance from God's word and learning from the examples of others, you can be confident when you contestant King David will have to make an important choice about keeping a promise he made a long time ago. Let's find out what he does and what the consequences are when you, King David, make your choice. Today's contestant is King David. Previously on the show, we had the elders of Israel who rejected God as their king and had Saul become their first human king of Israel. God agreed. But as we saw on the last episode, King Saul made some poor choices. Sure, he had some good excuses for those poor choices, but what was most important was to obey, obey with his whole heart. So that brings us now to you, King David. Yes, hi. So since Saul made some bad choices, right? God rejected him as king and decided to choose a man after God's own heart. Sound familiar? Well, yeah. You, King David. God chose you to be the next king. Yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Who knew that just loving and trusting God would be enough for God to make big things happen in your life? I mean, like, apart from that, I'm just a simple shepherd. Wow. Well, if it's one thing that we have learned from this show, is that even simple choices can have big consequences, whether for good or for bad. Not just for you, but for those around you as well. So good luck to you, King David. Well, with God guiding me, I don't really need luck. All right, all right. Well then, David, are you ready to make your choice? So most of us are familiar with your showdown with Goliath. I mean, that was amazing. One shot, one kill. So anybody else who you fight will be no match for you. If you kill Goliath, you could kill anybody else, right? Well, right after that, you met King Saul's son, Jonathan, and you guys hit it off, I mean like right away, you guys hit it off. You became BFFs forever. But even more seriously than that, you guys ended up making a friendship pact called a covenant. It's as big and it's as serious and as binding as marriage, but it's just between friends. So you and Jonathan, you promised to look out for each other, not only as if though you were brothers, but as if though you were the same person. I mean, well, th that's amazing. In today's world, we, we, can't, we can't wrap our minds around the type of friendship, the level of friendship that you and Jonathan had. I mean, you guys took, you guys took this promise very seriously. Today, people don't even take the promise of marriage as seriously as you guys took the promise of your know, friendship. Wow. Well, it was a big deal to us because we promised each other in front of God that we would take care of each other and that we would take care of each other's families for life. Wow. Now, here's where you have to make a choice. Jonathan's dad is King Saul. And God said, because of his bad choices, you were going to be the next king. This drove Saul mad, I'm talking crazy. So crazy, in fact, that while you were over there minding your own business one day, he shot at you with a spear trying to kill you. And then he put a bounty on your head. And I don't mean like bringing you back dead or alive. He wanted you dead. So what do you choose to do about it, David? You have two choices. A or B. A, kill King Saul whenever you get the chance. After all, God said that you were the rightful king. Or B, challenge King Saul to a duel. I mean, you beat Goliath. This man is no match for you. What's option C? Option C. Yeah, there is no option C. Those are your only two choices. There's always another choice. I made a promise to Jonathan. That's his father. I'm not going to kill his dad. 
And Saul is God's anointed, no matter what decisions he made. I'm not going to mess with that, even if I'm God's new choice for king. So I guess I'm going to run for the rest of my life until God sees it fit. And that way, I won't have to break my promise to Jonathan, and I won't have to touch God's anointing. Wow, that's a very serious commitment to a promise and to God. So let's lock in that new option, see? Run for your life so that you can keep your promise and respect God's current King of Israel. All right, David, are you ready? Yeah. You chose option C. You invented this door. That didn't exist before. Yes. Here's your next situation. Years have passed. You've been on a run for about 13 years of your life until King Saul is killed in battle against the Philistines. Philistines or Philistines? What do you say? Philistines. Okay, Philistines. And I'm sorry to tell you, his son, your friend Jonathan, he's dead. He was killed in battle. No! So, good news on the bright side, you're the next king. So, what do you choose to do as king now? Remember, kings always have to make choices. So as King David, you have two. In fact, we'll give you three choices this time. Because last time you asked for, for one. So you have A, B, or C. A, search out and kill, or at least drive out the rest of Saul's family. So you have no more trouble as you become the rightful king. B, throw a big party and feast to celebrate. Or C, all of the above. Through a big party. The king of Israel just died. And his son, my best friend, I'm not going to throw a party or a feast. I'm not even going to eat and drive out the rest of Saul's family. No, that was Jonathan's family too. In in fact, I want to know if there's any survivors from his family so that I could show kindness to them for Jonathan's sake. But David, Jonathan is dead. He's, he's dead. You don't have to keep your promise to him. Look, I made this promise to him before God to look out for each other as long as I live. I choose to keep my promises. I choose to be a man of my word, whether I have to or not. So you're telling me that even though Jonathan is dead, you don't have to keep your promise because he's not going to know. You're going to, instead of celebrate your enemy Saul's death, you're going to mourn. And you're also going to seek someone in Jonathan's family to be kind to. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Is that your final choice, King David? That is my final choice. All right, let's lock that in. You didn't pick the obvious choices that we gave you, but let's take a look and see how your choices, how they played out, and the consequences that they caused for you and the people around you, because you, King David, have made your choice. Jonathan, I think your dad's trying to kill me. No way. You're my best friend forever. We made a promise to God to look out for each other all the days of our lives. No way would my dad want to hurt me by going after you like that. Let me go talk to him. Hey, dad. I heard a rumor that... Where is that friend of yours, David? Oh, I think he went to visit his family in his hometown, Bethlehem. Ah! Yeah, you better run. He knows it's you who will be the next king, not me or a family line. He wants you dead. 
I'm so sorry, bro. Go in peace, my friend. The Lord is witness of our promise. Between you and me, and between your family and my family forever. David, David, King Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. You can now become the new king as promised by God. Jonathan, my friend, it's been years. I miss you, pal. Does anyone know if there's anyone left in Saul's family? I want to show kindness to this person. I want to do it for Jonathan's sake. Jonathan has a son still living. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? Bring him to me. Here I am, your majesty. I am Jonathan's son. Please don't kill me. I am not threat to you, my king. I promise. Don't be afraid. I will be kind to you because of the promise I made your father, Jonathan. I will give back to you all the land your grandfather Saul had. And you, you will always be able to eat at my table with my own sons. Because of the promise David made to his friend Jonathan, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem and every day he ate at the king's table. King David reigned as king for 40 years. He won many battles and made Israel a strong nation while always pointing his people back to God. Every day you have to make your choice. But how do you know what to choose? Let us learn some words to live by that will help you as you make your choice. Philippians 1, 9, and 10. This is my prayer for you, that your love will grow more and more, that you will have knowledge and understanding with your love, that you will see the difference between good and bad and choose the good that you will be pure and without wrong for the coming of christ and now verse 11 that you will be filled with the good things produced in your life by christ to bring glory and praise to god the final part of paul's prayer is that we would be filled with good things now good things doesn't mean stuff. Stuff gets old, breaks, becomes outdated. These things would be things like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And these things are produced or made in our life, not by working hard, but by Christ working in our hearts changing our minds and our hearts to be more like Him. Will you choose to let God work in your heart and mind to produce good things that will last forever? The choice is up to you. Make your choice. Every day, our life is full of choices. Some choices don't seem very important. Like, do you sweep the floor before you go out to play? Or do you just run off without sweeping the floor? But even small choices can set us on a path of good or bad that can affect the rest of our life, for better or for worse. And while we like to think, hey, it's my life, I can choose what I want to do, the truth is, our choices affect the people around us, whether for good or for bad. It's easy to make a promise. I promise I won't tell anyone who your crush is. I'll pay you back, I promise. But keeping a promise is harder. You have to actually remember that you promised someone to make an effort to do what you said you would do. You have to choose to keep your promises. It's easy to say you'll keep a secret until you have the chance to share it. It's easy to say you'll pay someone back 
until you actually have the money that you owe them and you find something else that you want to spend it on. So why is it important to keep your promises? Well, has anyone ever broken a promise they made to you? How did that make you feel? Probably bad. What did you think of that person after that? Was it easy for you to trust them again? Probably not. Now sometimes promises are broken because things are out of our control. Like if you promised to go somewhere, say to the beach, but there was a hurricane that very day, there's nothing you can do about that. That's out of your hands. But most of the times, there are a lot of things that we can do to keep our promises. Or better yet, be careful of what you actually promised in the first place. Did you know that God always keeps his promises? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 7, 9, he will keep his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Psalm 105 verse 8 says, He will always keep the promises he made to his people. An example of one of those promises God made was to send a savior to be born, to save the people from their sins. God kept that promise for 700 years until Jesus was to be born. And we can trust his promise to come back for those who love him. David is a great example of someone who kept his promise, even when it seemed that he didn't have to. He kept his promise to Jonathan, even when Jonathan's father was trying to kill him. Not even to protect his own life would he break his promise. And when his friend was long dead, he still kept his word to look after Jonathan's family. He made the effort to find someone, anyone from Jonathan's family to show honor to. In return, God honored David by establishing his kingdom and blessing him with great wealth and success. And the world was a better place because David kept his promise. Mephibosheth's world was impacted the most from being a crippled outcast to getting back all his family land and being treated like a prince, eating every day with the kings, his own sons. Could you imagine a world where everyone kept their promise? What would that world look like? if everyone could be trusted to do exactly what they said that they would do. If parents kept their promise of marriage or their promises to love and care for their children, I wonder if we all wouldn't feel just a little bit more cared for and safe. The truth is, some of us have to live with the broken promises of others. But you have a choice of how you want to live your life. Keeping your promises with the help of the Lord or making promises you won't keep like those who have broken promises to you. What will you choose to do? The choice is up to you. Make your choice.
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The man sinned and broke our relationship with God. But there's good news. God became man in Christ Jesus to live the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. But three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God and offering a free gift of salvation to everyone who repents and believes this good news. Salvation is to be saved from the punishment that humankind deserves for breaking our relationship with God. Repent means to turn away from the broken, sinful ways of living and to choose to follow God's ways. Believe means to decide to accept something as true, even if it's not something that you can see with your own eyes. Salvation is not something that you can get from God by working hard or being good. It's for those who choose to repent and instead follow God's ways of living. And for those who also choose to believe that God did come as Jesus to take our punishment, that he rose from the dead, and that he's coming back to rescue us from this broken world to be with him in heaven. Do you choose to believe that this is true? Will you choose to turn away from the sinful ways of living and follow God's ways for your life? It's up to you. Make your choice. Hello, beloved of God. Our text for today. Stand ready to help me. For I have chosen to follow your commandments. Psalm 119, verse 173. Now, Bill Hunter mentioned it to his father that Dickie wants to go back to Belize. We really think this is where the Lord wants him to be. Um, so pray about it and we, we have to try and figure out how to ship back his stuff and all of that. And he had this old vehicle. It's called a Fairlane car. I'm not sure what type of car that is, but it was like an antique kind of car. And there was this guy in Jamaica who collects these old cars. And this man went up there and met Uncle Bill's father and said, are you selling it? And he's like, well, you know, it's been there for five years. We haven't moved it. He's like, no, you're selling it? He's like, well, make me an offer then. Whatever, you make me a good offer and you could take it. And he gave Uncle Bill's father the money and Uncle Bill's father as Uncle Bill was there he looked at him and he go here put this money in an envelope and give it to Dickie for me and my father opened that envelope and there was four thousand three hundred and twenty dollars in that envelope all right whoa good amount of money and my father told his father who was a custom broker I'm going back to Belize and I need to ship back everything. When I mean everything, people, washing machine, bed, my father said even ship back the lamp. Nothing stayed. And his father told him, son, if you want that thing reach the Belize, before you go, it have to reach the port tomorrow. My father was like, no problem. In one night, they didn't sleep. They packed everything that was in the house. And then my uncle David, went to the house of this pickup the next morning they loaded the pickup carried it straight to the port and when he reached the port they weighed everything all the crates all the boxes and my father is standing there with the one envelope that he got from my uncle bill and he's like yes man so how much to ship all of these things back home and my father said then he knew how god is so good the cost came up to four thousand three hundred twenty dollars and twenty cents and he went into his pocket and took out the 20 cents and added it to the envelope and gave it to the man at the port. And when he was back in Belize, one month later, this was 1985 now, he was 37 years old, his friend Roy Boeing bought him a car. An old car, somebody was selling it 
and he gave him, he said, you need a car because you are always moving around and you have all these children and you're always preaching at different churches, you need a vehicle to go on. And he said, he remember one night he was preaching at a church outside of the city and while he was preaching, he saw this young man looking at him like trying to give him an eye like, he said, and literally, as a service, like as he was finished preaching, he said, you know, they were going to pray at end. He said, he went to the young man and the young man walked outside and met him. And the young man said, come here, Mr. Dickey. They have people not like you. I hear they want to stone you. And he said, and immediately he ran, jumped into his car and he was driving. The people came out of the church and grabbed stones and started to stone the vehicle. He said, but he was already driving off. And he said it hit him. He remembered what his mother had said. Do you remember? Hold that thought. You remember this? So when he was driving off and they were stoning him, he's like, ah, oh, leather, protection. I'm covered and under the cross. He said he made it out from that church. Can you believe it? <laughs> Trying to stone him. He said, but the Lord protected him. The Lord made that young man come and talk to him. And he left and he was able to be safe. So there he was, traveling, preaching, doing camps the same way, helping out with VBS, um, doing youth group, youth meetings. And he wasn't getting any money, just a little bit of money that the church was giving him. And now they decided they were going to cut that off completely. And he, once again, he was done. And Dickie said he remembered. They told him that the Friday evening. He said he would never forget it. They told him Friday evening, we don't want him more. We're not giving you any support. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, he went to the airport because my uncle Bill and his wife and Andrew were coming in to spend the summer with us. And he was at the airport waiting for Uncle Bill. And he said he was just standing there thinking like, Lord, what am I going to do? Just praying. And he heard somebody go, Dicky. And when he looked, it was the vice principal of Nazarene High School. He said, I need a religion teacher. Our religion teacher got sick. So I need a temporary teacher. Would you be able to do it? He said, when you want me to start? He go, how about today? He said, we need one like from like, now. He said, so you think you could start tomorrow? He said, just bring your qualifications and everything. And he went to Nazarene High School. And that's how he started to become a teacher. Just like what Mr. Gordon Rowe had told him many years ago. Classroom, open mission field. And he started to teach at Nazarene High School where he taught for 15 years. So he went to a meeting one night that T.D. Jakes was a guest speaker. The T.D. Jakes. And the place was packed up with all these pastors and ministers people and T.D. Jakes in the middle of his message stopped and he said there's someone here who the Lord has called for a special mission but you're afraid to step out because of the financial situation that you're in but the Lord wants you to know that where he has given you the vision he will make the provision and when he was sitting there like Dickie knew it was him, but he didn't say anything. But you know, Coffee, his friend Raymond, who was beside him, go, Dickie, Dickie, that is for you. And Dickie said he just got up immediately and he walked out. He walked out, he couldn't believe it. And he said, okay, still, still kind of hesitant. Really, Lord, is this really for me? And he said he was at home one night, he and Loretta sitting down watching TBN. And I remember him saying to me, it was a trip family. I don't know if some of you remember them. It was this whole family that used to sing together. And the father who was singing, he's the one that shares in between. He stopped and he was talking. And then he said, if you have a problem leaving where you are to fulfill God's call on your life, you will only leave when the misery factor exceeds your fear factor. You need to step out in faith. And that really hit that day. And he was like, okay, Lord, this is really, really where you want me to be, but I'm still not sure. 
and he went to bed at night and he had a dream. He said, I dreamt, I came onto a street, another street. And when I looked over here, it was like a wire fence, but there was a black shed in the yard. And across from the black shed, there was a very small church, a small chapel. And in the yard with the black shed, there was a man in a wheelchair who had no legs. And this man was selling sweets to children from the shed. And then the man in the wheelchair looked at me and said, don't you see them? Don't you see the children and the young people coming in and out of the church who need the Lord? And you are there waiting, fearfully, doing nothing. So the leaders of the church came and told him, Dickie, a church is up for sale. The lady came because her husband passed away, who was a pastor. She can't afford the mortgage payment. She asked us if we would like to buy the church, but we're not interested in planting a new church somewhere else. I know you are. Would you be interested to go and see it? And my father was like, sure, no problem. We could go and check it out. And he, Dickie and Loretta got in the vehicle and went to this location. And when they drove up to a small little church on a narrow little road on the south side of Belize City, he got out of the car and when he looked across the street, there was a chain link fence. There was a black shed in the yard. There was a man in a wheelchair selling sweets to children. And he knew this is the church that he should buy. This is where God wanted him to be. So he and Loretta took their savings, literally took their savings. And he went and he told his best friends. He told Roy, he told Flo, he told Miss Heidi, he told his friend Raymond, remember who was there at TJX, and he told them, you know what? The Lord is telling me I need to plant a church. I need to start a church. And all of these people that he told gave him money towards paying down for the building. And Raymond told him, you know what? I will pay the first mortgage payment. If you get through, I will pay it. And September 1st, 1998, the doors were open. But before he opened the doors, he was like, what should I name this church? Lord, it's your work. What do you want me to call it? And if you know Dickie, he loves to walk and talk to himself. But he likes to do it at night when it's quiet. And so he was walking around in his yard, walking around in his yard. And while walking and meditating on the word of God, the Lord brought up Revelation chapter 3 to him. And in Revelation chapter 3, it said, See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. <sighs> open door, the Beaver's Chapel, was open September 1st, 1998. And he remembered, Dickie thought about it. He remembered that time when he left Jamaica and his church leaders had a special service, remember? And uh, Mr. Roy Campbell, who was one of the pioneer missionaries of the Bridging Work, came here and he laid his hand, remember, on his right shoulder. Now he realized what he was doing. He passed on that pioneering spirit to him. And now he had planted a Bridging Church. One night when Dickie was sleeping, another dream came to him. He's been working the church, open door going well. And he remembered the same vice principal that gave him the job in his dream vividly, standing by a piano, singing, singing, and I mean beautiful singing. And Dickie said he couldn't sing that great. He could sing, but And the melody though in the song in his dream, he had never heard it before. So when he woke up from the dream, he said, Lord, if this is a song that you're giving me for this church, be gracious to me, Lord. Bring it back again. And he told Loretta, and she said, let us pray that the Lord will bring it back again. And three weeks later, the dream repeated itself. So he jumped out of the bed. He grabbed his pen and his book because he had left it on the night side table. Because just in case that dream came back, he would have a pen and paper ready. And he jumped up and he grabbed his pen and paper. 
Let the song be raised, His mighty name be praised. No other name should be extolled. Oh, let the song be raised. The Lord had given him a song for open door. And we sing it all the time. Now, three years later, going good, ministry growing, church growing. And he was there and he was driving home from work every time. You know, he'd go and he'd pick up my mother from work, from where and they're driving. And a pain, a excruciating pain, just shot through his wrist and shot him in his knee. And he actually had to pull off the road. And he was holding his wrist. And he's like, Lolly, 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 I think my wrist broke. See, like, Dickie, how your wrist went broke? You just to drive the car. But he's like crying out in pain. And he stayed, and then the pain eased. All right. Okay. Couple weeks later, he was refing a cricket match because he used to like refing a cricket match for high school. And he said it was Baka IT vet. And they're refing, and he stepped off. And as he stepped off, he fell because he thought his knee and his or his ankle had broken. He just dropped down and he was grabbing it. He's like, I, I think I broke my ankle. I think it's broken. So people ran over. The boys on his team picked him up, literally had to pick him up and they carried him to his car and they checked it. He's like, no, Mr. Dickey, your ankle not broken. He said, like, oh, I'm in so much pain. All right. Go the pain is gone again. Couple weeks later again, he was walking. They said they go catch bus. Walk by Pong Yard. And he just collapsed. Just fell down. When he woke up back, he was in the hospital. And the doctors in Belize said, Miss Loretta, we do not know what is wrong with your husband. We've done all kind of tests, blood works. We've never seen something like this before. Look here, you need to decide. There are only two places that maybe could help him. You either have to go to Merida or go to Jamaica. Of course, my mother picked Jamaica. And my Uncle Bill met them at the airport. And my Uncle Bill had lined up everything at the hospital. They carried him to the hospital and my mother stayed by my Uncle Bill once she couldn't sleep at the hospital. And he was in there. First week, the doctors came. My father called them vampires. Because every time they come, they would stick him, stick him to draw blood. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Second week, nobody could figure out what was wrong with him. Third week, still there. And this time they moved him. They moved him from that ward and they carried him to another ward that they call the death ward. It was a ward that they put people in when they just didn't know what else to do. And his bed was the farthest one from the bathroom because he couldn't move. And Candy was living on campus at UA. So she'd walk come to the hospital because he was at a UA hospital. And one day she came and she visited him and she's like, Daddy, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But take heart, Jesus is praying for you and you will yet arise again to show God's love to another generation. And my father said he always remembered my sister telling him that and he would just like groan, like, mm, mm, you know? So one night when he was lying in bed, remember he couldn't move, he couldn't breathe well, he said he remembered he felt someone squeeze his ankle while lying in bed. And he opened his eyes and he saw a figure, like someone sitting on the end of his bed. And he heard a voice whisper to him, Get up, go to the bathroom. He said, but he couldn't move. The person squeezed his ankle again. Get up, go to the bathroom. And this happened another time. And Dickie was lying in bed, barely couldn't move. He was in so much pain. He's like, I don't have the strength. I don't know if I can get up. We can learn a lot by looking at the examples of others, like King David, and into God's word to know and understand what the right choices are to make in everyday life. 
So there we learn that you can choose to keep your promises. And we saw that God honors that and the world can be a better place for those living in it. When we choose to keep our promises. Thank you for joining us today. Until next time, be wise and consider the consequences when you make your choice. See you next time, guys. Same time, same place. Our next contestant next week will be King Rehoboam, King David's grandson. And if he's anything like his grandfather, things are going to be looking good for the kingdom of Israel. See you next time.